Hi and uh, welcome to this video lecture on going from a world of discourse to a digital representation or if you wish how to create geospatial digital representation models. Um, in this lecture I will continue where we left off in the previous lecture we, on having a conceptual model so we had created a conceptual model based on this image from uh, Peter Bruegel, the Elder Hunters in the Snow. And we talked about different conceptual models that could be used to represent the information from it. So we went from reality to conceptual model. And in this video, we will take it one step further and go from our conceptual model to a digital representation. So we will look at how we can represent our conceptual models in using spatial digital data. Um, and especially we'll be looking at those most common types, raster and vector representation. We start out with a uh, closer look at um, the raster representation model. Um, what we have is that um, we can think of a raster model just like a, um, a, a photograph. So we have this regular grid of cells where we can have values in each cell and where each cell then represents a location. Um, it's so much just like a image that we also can use the same data format. So we can have TIFF files which we can use both for photographs and we can also use them for geospatial data. Um, rasters can be uh, can have multiple um, bands, so we can have um, let's say three bands for our typical uh, uh, photograph. So we had a band for the red, the green, and the blue light. Um, or if it was a satellite, we can have thirty bands. Um, but we, uh, we, so we can have a different number of bands in the same data set. We can also think of the raster cells will always have um, numerical representations in them. So each cell will always have a number in it. But these numbers can then be used to code for different categorical values. So number one meaning a, um, a forest, number two meaning a um, a town and so on. And there's one thing about rasters is that they can all have, we can't have two cells at the same location. Um, so um, it's difficult to you do things like um, um, mapping of forest fires and things like that where we can have overlapping property values. In that case we will have to have multiple layers, one for each year for instance. Um, or do other um, strange tricks, but in general, we we can't use them for for that type of data. Um, if we look at some of the classic examples of uh, raster data, um, we can see the first one uh, is a heat map. So it's a, a processed satellite image. It hasn't been classified, but it has been processed. We've taken the thermal infrared and um, mod do some calculation on it to translate to surface temperature. So this is um, a map sh showing um, surface temperature and you see this clear um, uh, heat island about where we have the Copenhagen, this is Copenhagen where we see the central part of Copenhagen is much warmer than the outskirts. We can also have classified satellite data. So this is Next example is a example from the Corinne classification system where we have um, classified some Landsat data. We can use um, density functions. I've talked about this example before. So this is the density of crime rate in a specific um, area of Denmark. We can have aerial photographs. We can have um, this DTM, DSM, DTM is digital terrain model and DSM is digital surface model. So it's um, 
a data set that arrives from a laser scanning. So in this case, it's a laser scanning of Copenhagen Airport, where, and this is what we call a surface model, a DSM, because what we see is the highest occurring thing. So we can see the, the, the tail fins of the airplanes on, um, on the, around the airport, and we can see the individual buildings and trees and the motor road leading over to Sweden. And finally, we can also use raster, or raster data is typically also used for interpolation. So this could be uh, a pollution data set or some gas measurement or something where we have measurements in the individual blue spots on, on the image here. And then we have done an interpolation of that property between these points. So lots of examples where we use raster. If we look at it and say, OK, what is the pros and cons of raster? Well, on pro plus side, we can say that many data sets are born raster. Aerial photographs, satellite data, laser scannings, things like that. They are born as raster data. Um, there's um, many types of analysis, so surface flow and lots of analysis types that are quicker or much faster in raster than in vector because um, neighboring cells are also physically neighboring in the data structure. So it's much quicker to pour water from one cell to the next if we're doing it in a raster than if we're doing it in a vector version. Um, and especially if we have um, something that is continuous varying um, uh, a property field such as elevation and so on. A, um, a raster data is typically a more efficient way of representing the data. Um, on the negative side is that there is always a, a smallest or, near, or narrowest element. So um, no point can be smaller than one cell or, um, or a road can't be uh, narrower than one cell. That means that we typically have um, mixed uh, cell problems. So, and the problem of this is that we can only have one value. So if we look at the little example here, um, we can only say that in the cell we could have how much how, land or water. Okay. So if that was the case, some of those mixed cells, they should have, go to our land or water. Um, so there's always a bit of a problem there. Um, another thing is that's no concept of entities. So we can't talk about a lake, a wood, so on. Um, we can talk about this cell is occupied by a wood or that this cell is occupied by water. But we can't talk about which lake it is. We just say this is water or this is a wood. And um, this also means that there's less uh, of a cartographical um, possibilities. We can't make hatch, hashing of it. We can't make gradient colors because we don't know which is the edge. Um, if there's no object there, we don't know is this in the middle of the object or is it the edge of the object. We just know that it is a lake. So we can't. It's difficult to make maps where the edges of the lake are light blue and the center is dark blue, for instance. So there's quite a lot of um, cartographic limitations in raster data compared to what we can do in the vector data. Um, if you look at our vector data, um, geometries is stored as points, lines, and polygons. Um, again there, um, polygon is, is a wrong word. We always use it, which to correct would be to say points, lines, and areas, because as we can see these small green uh, elements is that we can have multiple areas of the same object. I have mentioned that some Danish municipalities have many islands as part of the municipality. Or, and if, if it was lakes that were represented, that could be an island in the lake. So that could be a hole in the polygon. And strictly speaking, from a mathematical point of view, then it's not a polygon. Um, the geometry uh, of objects in the vector version 
can just, are just seen as any other property. So we talked about um, that we, when we do the representation, we do it in this um, relational data model. And then again, then the geometry then becomes an attribute or a column in the relational table. So in that way, the geometry is treated very much like all of the other properties of an object. Um, and if you wish, you can do similar structures um, in vector as in raster. So you can have this, um, we, we, we then call them tessellations, where we tile up the area into a small bit. But in the vector version, we have more possibilities. We can don't have to be small squares. They can be triangles or hexagons or whatever shape you want. So there's um, some more possibilities in doing the tessellation rather than the, the square of the rasters. So there's many additional, uh, you can say that the vector data is probably a more flexible data set, a way of representing, um, and gives us more possibilities. If we look at, again, at the pros and the cons, we can say that, yeah, vectors have, um, if you look at that, um, at entities and categorical partitioning, the vector will probably be a much more compact data form, so it won't take up as much space. Um, so if you're going to make a, a representation of all the buildings in Denmark, it will take up a lot of space if you're going to do it with a one by one meter resolution of Denmark. If you're doing the raster compared to you wanted to do it in vector, it would take only a fraction of the same data space. Um, there's in no limit, there's a practical limit, but there's in, in basically there's no limit for how small you can do things. So we can have elements that are 0.0001 millimeter large, but so we don't have that element of that the raster cell sets a size limit. Um, there is a size limit because it is a digital world, so we can't make the infinitively precise coordinates. This is of a quite different magnitude than if you're talking about raster data where you typically have size limits of meters or even kilometers. Um, there's lots and lots of cartographical possibilities, aggregation, displacement, lots of strange things we can do to make a nice cartographical product. On the downside, we can say that what raster was good for is many of these um, spatial operations, doing analysis, simulations, things like that. Uh, and um, we will often find that there is um, raster data is a bit more complex data structure and it's a bit more error prone than, than raster. Raster is a relatively simple structure. So um, there's often, you know, some small problems that you have to address in order to make the data set function as you want it to do. So, it's a bit more complex to work with vector data than with raster, but that's probably the, sm the smallest of the problems. Um, one thing we have to do uh, is that we can't just make a digital representation. It's important that we start planning it um, and look at that process. Um, there's a limited amount of planning involved in in working with uh, raster data, especially because raster data is in generally a output of other a capture device such as satellite. So it is a raster when it comes down, or it is a result of a interpolation of things like that. It's very seldom that we create raster data by hand. Um, so there's a lot of, 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 of things we do not have to consider. Of course, we have to consider is the resolution so the cell size appropriate, and we might want to try and change that. When talking about vector data and this relational data model, um, and converting our properties or entities uh, into um, tables or relations, uh, and in general we say that each entity type, so buildings, become one table or relation, if you wish, and that each of our properties from our entity becomes a attribute or column in our 
table or relation. Okay, so um, with that, that's relatively simple. Um, if you have these uh, multi-dimensional things, it becomes a bit more complicated. But we'll look at that uh, in a later video. Um, we have also talked that um, that uh, one of our columns will contain the geometry, so it describes how the location uh, that would describe the location uh, of the in information in the entities, and uh, we'll also have to talk about which type of geometry um, that is um, available. So we have to decide if it's going to be points, lines, or polygons. In most implementation, um, you can only have one. So in the same relation, it can only be points, lines, or polygons. Um, so um, that's a bit of a when you have to decide um, about which type of geometry you're going to have in your data set. So if we uh, look at, uh, and, and then there's one more thing is that we have to declare our type of attributes. So each type of attribute we work with has to be of a specific data type, um, or at least in most implementations it does. So um, when we decide that um, the property height has to be represented by an attribute, we call it height again, we'll have to decide what data type is that attribute going to be of and there's there are some uh, five six different um, uh, typical data types so in reality there's many more depending on the implementation but in in main terms we can talk about integers so we look at numbers first so there's integers so that is a whole number so with no fractional values so one two three four and so on not 1.6, that is not an integer. Um, integers come in, uh, in typically in two uh, data sets, going one typical small integer, going from minus 35, uh, 32,700 and whatever, to plus uh, 32,767. So that range, all integers in that range are represented. Okay, So we are sure that there is a 32,000 768, 32,767, and so on. All values, all integer values in the range are represented. There's also a large integer which will represent um, um, 2,000, so billion, um, so plus minus 2 billion. Um, in, in, again, there with all different values represented. There are decimal values, or they are sometimes called real values, or floating point values, uh, or float nest. Um, these are numbers with a fractional value, so 4.5, 3.2, 99.9, and so on. Um, what is important there is that not all values, so it might be possible to represent 4.5672 but not 4.5673 so of course because that is between any two decimal uh, values there will be infinitively many values and of course that can't be represented in a finite computer so we will only have specific values present again just like with um, integers they are there's a small one and a large one uh, or sometimes called a double and they represent uh, from minus 3.4 with uh, 38 zeros after it to um, <coughs> 1.2 with 38 zeros after it or from 2.2 uh, with 308 zeros after it to 1.8 uh, with 308 zeros after it so that's different ranges um, but again there remember that there is only some specific values present so there will always be a bit of a rounding problem when you do calculations on floating values um, and can give peculiar results so be aware that floating values or real values or decimal values whatever they call they um, 
they have they can result in unexpected calculations mostly it's not a problem the other main four types are text strings so they are called text or strings um, typically you have to specify a number of characters so you say okay this attribute is going to be a text attribute and that will have to be 40 or 50 or whatever characters typically uh, most implementations support up to 65,000 characters so normally you can have relatively long te uh, text but you can't put a full report or something there's there's typically a limitation there um, date or time or even date time combination so they will also be um, typical data types you can choose so if you have a attribute specifying a date of an event or a time of a day of an event or just a reoccurring event at a specific time you can use this type of attributes um, especially with uh, date time or time be aware that many computer implementations they um, computers really started the 1st of January 1970 so that is a, a zero value of that date um, so some implementation they can't go further back with that so be aware of that problem then we have boolean attributes true or false is this building condemned or is this building a pub or whatever so things you can answer true or false to yes or no they're called booleans and then in some implementation you will find something called a blob um, it's a nice word stands for binary large object and um, basically it's any it's a video recording a picture uh, a video sound and if you want to store that in the same data structure as your geometry then you can use blobs for that um, like with um, the conceptual model it's important to document your work so um, ways of doing this is that if you're talking about raster data um, things to document and write down is what is the entity and the pro and, and or categorical partition of, of the field you're working with what it is so that part from um, your conceptual model where you said what it is 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 it buildings is it only buildings larger than 10 square meters and so on we need that of course then we need to know um, how many bands are there and which properties each band uh, represents so you could have a um, a band representing if you a satellite the reflection in specific uh, wavelengths so we see that would be seven bands or eight bands or whatever with different wavelengths on them or we could have a band representing the temperature in January a band representing the temperature in February March and February so you would have 12 bands um, so specifying the number of bands and what each band what property is in each band um, of course um, you'll need to specify the size how big is a cell so the position of the data set um, so are they if it's a, a landsat image it would be 25 meters or is it one by one meter or kilometer by kilometer so specifying the size of the of the cells typically in meters and um, then finally how the cell um, references to spatial locations so which mechanism does it use to um, to reference to a spatial case we'll cover that in another video for the vector data set first of all it's exactly we have to represent exactly the same information in our documentation so what was the entity or categorical partition or whatever that we are representing again taking it from our conceptual model then let me need to talk about which properties we have registered of the of the entity we have registered so then that what columns or attributes they have become so that the column or attribute height represents the height of the building in meters um, so we need to represent that we also have to document which data type it is is it an integer is it a, or is it a float so do we have only have meters 
in whole numbers, so 1 meter, 2 meter, 3 meter, or do we have meters as decimal values? Um, we also have what's called the constraint, so we can say what is, what is the maximum uh, value for the height, how high a building can we have, so let's say that if the building was more than 200 meters, that will result in an hour, so it's a way of trying to minimize the number of hours in your data set by specifying some constraints on it, some error checks. It can also help optimize the data storage. Um, so typically we say that uh, height of the building must be somewhere between zero and let's say 200 meters, um, and then that will have the, the building height. Um, and finally, again, we will have to specify the geometry, what type of geometry is it, a point, point line or polygon, and, um, and which mechanism does it use to reference to, um, to the location in space. Again, there we'll cover those mechanisms in another video. Um, so, and then, of course, these documentations can be done in lots of different ways. Um, personally, I'll normally do something like that. This say, okay, the name of my relation, it could be buildings, and then um, I could give a description of it, saying, okay, this is all buildings that are larger than 10 square meters, or whatever we have described in a conceptual model. Then I'll describe the geometry, so in this case it would be a polygon, and using this ESPG, this is ESPG is the abbreviation of European Petroleum Survey Group, um, and they define some um, coding for different ways of referencing to um, geometry or to location. And this um, 25832 is a method we typically use in Denmark. Um, so you will probably be seeing that a lot. Uh, and then finally, I will document the individual attributes with their name. So in this case, there's the use of the building. I will give a description, this, blah, blah, this is the use. I'll give it a data type, so this is a text. I could also include how many characters the longest word be. So there won't be any words longer than 20 characters, for instance. And then a constraint, so if I want to make sure that only specific uses are registered, so um, people don't go around inventing their own registrations. So I can say this one has to be a dwelling, a pub, in uh, a place of worship, a water mill. So I could give a list of different values that are the only legal values for that. Or if I talk about um, the, the year of, con of construction, I could say, well, this is um, the year that the building has been constructed based on some visual interpretation of the building's age, and the architecture, and so on. It will be of the type date, and it will be, in the case of Hunters in the Snow, let's say somewhere between uh, 1200 and 1600. And then if, um, normally we would say after Christ or after the end of day AD, um, but if you, you know, don't want to be Christian in your referencing, you can use the ISO uh, 8601 uh, 8, classification, which is basically having negative values before Christ and positive values after Christ. So you don't have to specify any Christian references in your, in your data there. And then finally, we have a height, the height of the building, um, or the highest place on the roof. Uh, but not including chimneys, that would be a decimal value. And in the case of Hunters in the Snow, there's no skyscrapers in that data set. So um, let's say buildings are between one and, and 200 meters high. So that was all for this video on how we construct um, the, uh, the, the, the digital representation of our GM model. Um, in a later more, uh, video, we'll talk about how we can do it in different software types. But first, of all, this is just the general discussion of the problems and especially how we, um, we document it. Remembering that documentation is a really important part of your work. 
um, for many reasons as I've mentioned earlier. So I hope you liked the video, hope to see you in another video, bye!